This is the Dope Black Dad Podcast. My name is Marvin Harrison and I'm coming smooth today. The reason why I feel so smooth is because I use Palmer's not joking. No, um, that would have been a really good advert for something. I, 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 I got to get sponsored. I think you should just do the whole intro in that smooth voice. Can and I do we it? should all do our smooth voices. Okay. Should we? <clears throat> all right, cool. Ken might get excited though. Cause... It's okay. <laughs> if Ken gets excited, that means whoever's listening I or have watching a very will get big excited. gay van base. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Excellent. bigger than the women fan base. So let this go down when you're ready. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the second podcast is always wild. I'm sorry. It's just like losing our faculties. This is the Top Blads Out podcast. My name is Marvin Harrison, and I am delighted today because we are in a Spotify studios again. They have allowed us to return. We don't know why, but we are not going to complain. Leslie is baking things and making ornaments to send to the head of Spotify to continue our long-term relationship. Yes. Okay, I will well, be. <laughs> while we are here, I don't know why I just made you very gendered and gave you like a I gendered know. role, like in a kitchen baking, baking? stuff for men. No, I'm gonna. I'm, so not miss. I'm, no, no, no I'm, I'm going to be in the kitchen helping her. Okay, that's fine. I'll be your chef's assistant. Yeah, I think you can lead. I'll assist you. Mary, I think you can cancel your friend. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I said I need three. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, so one, two one down, down backup. Two, go. two backups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yo, do not leave me alone on this microphone. So, we are joined here today. And not only are we continued to be joined by Ken and his wonderful wife, Mary, the authors of Financial Joy, we also have with us Leslie. Leslie. How are you? Thank you so much for joining us today. I am so good. I'm feeling amazing and I'm using the smooth voice because mm. that's the voice that we all agreed. We were going to introduce ourselves with today, mm. right? Yeah. Leslie, can you tell us your relationship to green? Oh, right. Okay. Green is my uh, earthly color. It's my color of happiness and it connects me to nature, which is mm, I'm nice. an earth sign. So yeah. that's why green looks good on me and I wear green a lot. So every time I see you, I get that feeling, and you out peacock me every time. And I sit there and think to myself, I need to find more outfits. So next time I'm coming in hard and hot with some sort of multicultural peacocking outfit to take my crown back. You know, you went from oh. smooth, very wet into my man, the, creepy, the... creepy, menacing. No, nah, not him, Attenborough. David, David. Ooh, it was the breathiness, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. There it are was black the... people yeah. in the studio talking. <laughs> <laughs> How do we stop it? How do we stop it and end this before they get ideas about reclaiming all of their wealth? Oh shit. Yeah, cool. We okay. went there. We went there. Uh, so, Ken and Mary, how are you doing? Thank you for sticking around. Actually, Good, we man. just we just kidnapped you. you. You actually have things to do. You have your kids to pick up from school, so now they're just standing outside the school gates because you want to hang uh, out with us. Tell the truth. This is a good space, man. Yeah. We're loving it. We're, we're definitely loving it here. You need to do all you can to secure this spot for as many podcasts as possible. Yes, what can we'll you make return. to bribe the head of Spotify? What can you make? I just bring myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> Clearly, this is how Ken got captured, so we understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's a powerful one. Yeah. I am here. <laughs> yes. Uh, Darwood, how are you? I'm really good. Mm. This is really good. And I'm wearing green accidentally. Oh. So I'm matching with Leslie, kind of. Yeah. You've got a more repredescent, is that a good word? What's green? the word? Do you Just mean iridescent? Flow. Iridescent, that's Thank it. you. Iridescent. What do you guys know of your learned words? <laughs> yeah. We should have never given black people books. It's, What's going on? It's the glow. It's, 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 it's glow. So, Leslie, one of yes. the things that we discovered in the last podcast is that Darwood is open and ready for love. It's the deepest kind. Ah, uh, just one second, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, what we would like to do mm -hmm. is create a possibility. Just a space of possibility. If you know of any women who are potentially open to a charismatic, funny, kind, authentic man who they would like to spend the rest of their life with, or at least 45 minutes, please introduce them. To and Darwin. the 44 of those minutes will be hers. Oh, I don't know what that means. Amazing. What does that mean? So he's saying that he's a listener, a good mm. listener. Mm. He's like 
you're prioritizing her, right? Wherever you want, it will be yours. Okay. For wow. four minutes. If you feel that Darwood <laughs> is someone that you could love and add quality to his existence, okay. please Even email only us for 45 minutes. at hello at black.org <laughs> and we will arrange a first date, preferably somewhere where you're walking in nature, holding hands. And wearing with no green. shoes on. <laughs> <laughs> so what I love is that we can do about 12 minutes of this podcast and not actually say anything other than hello. But hello, guys. Hello. 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 Hi. hello. Hi. So, um... The producer, and someone who means a lot to me, I don't call her a producer full time, but producer, she was going through things online and she found this story mm. and she shared it with me. And you know when like you're busy and someone shares you something on the phone, mm. it has to be good. Otherwise it's a little bit like we did, you know, <laughs> but it was good. So, so this is the, so this for me sums up pretty much all my dynamics in a form of a relationship. And I'll explain why, but then we'll go into this more. So a woman told her husband to put the soup in the fridge, which is a, you know, a reasonable request. Mm. Human being A would like help. Please put the food that I made in the fridge so it stays fresh. edible. Fresh, yeah. fresh is the yeah. word. Yeah. And then what happened was the gentleman in question put the entire crock pot and lead and plug oh. in the fridge. Whoa. Oh. Hmm. Okay. This is what the internet is calling. Okay, this is really important. Passive aggressive laziness. What I love is that everything that happens now on the internet has a psychological, behavioral, therapeutic language to go alongside it. But like passive aggressive table. laziness, mm. where it's like you asked me to do something and technically I did it, mm. but I did it in the most obtuse way humanly possible. Mm. Do you consider this passive aggressive behavior? Hmm. Could be poor communication. That's a man speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, could be. You know, she maybe. asked in a really yeah. poor way, so therefore I put it in the fridge in a really poor way. The math is not mathing, but two men have spoken. Sense, yeah. I haven't spoken yet, but we're gonna go to the women in the space. <laughs> yeah, do you know what? I did at first think when you said it the first time, it was a case of you know expectations versus reality. There was a breakdown in communication. Mm. But then now, you know, hearing you give me more context about the plug, actually there was no <laughs> breakdown in communication. He knew exactly what he needed to do because he obviously has never seen that pot in the fridge before. With a plug on it. With a plug. Because I'm not going to lie, I'll raise my hand up to say I've put a pot of food in the fridge before. Mm. Uh, That's normal. For a brief period until I can like find the time to put in Tupperware. But this sounds like something he's never seen in the fridge. So he knew what to do. Mm. He knew what to do. He was mm. just being lazy. Leslie. How I... about? Hold on, hold on. Uh -oh. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I, 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 when I saw the image of the crop pot in oh. the fridge with the plug and lead <laughs> and everything else, yeah. I think he was somehow having an argument with his partner <laughs> without angry. having the argument with her. Mm. <laughs> There's some underlying. Yep issues going on in that household mm. unresolved conversations and mm. some disputes that um, yeah it's something deeper mm. do, do you just think sometimes yeah and only this happens in in intimate relationships because if i was visiting your house and you asked me to do that i would find the energy to do it probably much better based on what i think you mm. would want mm -hmm. but in a relationship i'm just like if you tell me to do one more thing one more again yeah <laughs> I'm just going to throw the soup out the window. I just don't even care about the soup. It's soup. Mm. I'll buy soup. I'll buy you 10 liters of soup if you leave me alone. Yeah? So I'm going to explain something. <laughs> the other day, in my home, and I'm sharing my space with another human being for the first time in a long time, and I'm open, okay, to whatever is needed to make that flow. Okay? Love is important. <laughs> <laughs> As someone who is neurodivergent, Hyperfocus is a real thing. When it happens, nothing can penetrate. So therefore, if I'm in hyperfocus and I communicate, I'm in a zone. I'm writing slides in my sleep. 
I'm solving problems left, right, and center. Everything's flowing. It's almost God level. That's the wrong. You shouldn't say God. Uh, Why not? A mutant. What's the X Men? X Men level. God's a mutant. He's a friend of us. And so I was like, I think she asked me to do something from a loving place. She was already cleaning the space and she asked me to clear a table. It's a reasonable request. And just out of sheer absenteeism, by the time she had finished cleaning pretty much the whole house, I was still in my laptop, (laughs) finishing my emails. This is 20 minutes later. Now, because we love each other, we don't, we don't throw, we don't throw things at people. We don't make accusations. We breathe. Okay. She waited two days. (laughs) 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 Two days. She waited two days. And just on the, just on a casual car drive on the way to somewhere, she was like, huh, the other day. And I was like, yeah, what happened the other day? She was like, well, look, I asked you to do something. You said yes. I came back. It wasn't done. And in that time, I, I now can visualize me typing really furiously, looking up to her, pointing at a table, seeing the table was full, mathing what was required, going back into my zone, and then time blindness just took me into another hour. Now, I know this, okay? She understands I'm ADHD, so she understands. But also, she needs things too. And I feel like in relationships... The request to do things on other people's time mm. is very difficult. Mm. And also doing it in the way that they value in their time is even more difficult. So when you add the variables of ADHD, sometimes I just forget. And it's not about anybody. It's not, you're not important. Just time flies and I'm having the best time ever. And then I'll probably go to her and be like, hey, look at the thing I just did. She's like looking at that table that hasn't been done. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I just solved the world's problems. And <laughs> helped helped 30 cancer. companies. <laughs> and like, I, I realized that this is like a common occurrence, okay, in dynamics. How do you do stuff on people's time? Because in my downtime, you're there. So I don't get a time to be like, I get to recharge and hide. And, and be by myself and just exist. Because in that time when you see me doing nothing, I may get a request to do something. But then if someone stranger turns up and knocks on the door and they're like, hey Marv, and I'm like, yo. But, but 10 minutes ago, I was very frustrated at the fact that you made me get up and do something I didn't want to do. And so the question is, how can you find positivity and love for that person? When 10 minutes ago, you didn't have positivity and love for me in putting the things away. And so I'm merging about eight conversations together, but the general gist is, how do you balance a request from a loved one, someone that you want around, that has beautiful eyes, wonderful smile, (laughs) incredibly kind, someone that will be in your future, whether she likes it or not, love is there. How do you work around what she wants, when she wants it, and still exist in your own space and realm. Anyone? Well, I'm a very practical person. I'm a Virgo. I just, solution-based. So in that scenario, if you're both challenged with time and Mm. finding time to have free time to be with each other, then you have to hire in help. So if it's cooking or cleaning, Mm I would throw a solution at that. I would say, okay, hon, let's not have any arguments over these day-to-day chores and tasks, things that we both don't enjoy doing. And let's look at our budget Mm. and see if we can hire in the help Mm -hmm. that comes in once or twice a week to help us manage our time so we get to spend more time together Mm. doing stuff we love. I love you a little bit more. Okay. I'm so practical. That was technically my solution, but we don't want to take... You know, we're not here to point score. You know? <laughs> we're not here to be right. We're here to just discover. <laughs> Mary and Ken, how do you do it? What happens when you ask him to do something and he's solving people's financial crisis? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, so I guess it's not really... It's, it's not what you ask. is about how you ask it. Mm-hmm. Mm. And there are times when, yeah where if 
there's time constraints and maybe I'm doing dinner, something needs to be done quickly, I might not communicate in the best way. So I've noticed like depending on how I communicate or depend on, you know, the response that I get from Ken. But Ken's very hands on. Mm. Um, but he's a bit like you in that he can also be in the zone. I'm thinking, oh, I hope my, my husband doesn't have ADHD as well. Like, but, investigate, um, he, it's fun. It's a whole journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he, <laughs> he does, he can really zone in and get work done, which is needed. It's important. Mm. That's why we are where we are in our business because we have to be consistent and get work done when it needs to get um, done. So yeah, I, I ask him to do some random things around the house and he'll say, yes, babe, I'll do it. He never says no, but he'll say, I'll get around to it. And I wait patiently. <laughs> <laughs> a bit like your missus, you know, I probably started to have a bit of anger bubbling underneath yeah, the yeah, surface. Yeah. <laughs> and then Ken will surface from his desk. Babe, I'm done. I want a cuddle. And I'm like, no, no cuddles, babe. <laughs> <laughs> and then he smiles at me and I forget everything. I'm like, okay, then I'll give you a cuddle. But um, yeah, it's just, it's just understanding. And the thing still that. stays undone though, after the cuddle. I've probably done it because I've, yeah. I've asked you and yeah. you've said, babe, yeah, I'll get around to it. And there's deadlines for certain things. Yeah. So I've just had to probably do it myself yeah. and understand that he's also bringing, he's doing something that's very important. So, so, so it's about the vision of labor, really. There's, yeah. yeah. So I think that's a really interesting point. And I like, look, I think we've come from a time where it's been quite problematic in saying that men make money. And we go to work and we do that thing well. And you do the home and family really well. Mm. And then we try to get to a place where we split um, and do more 50-50 on both of those as much as possible. Obviously, you have societal limitations. But what I've realized is, is that whoever is the best at something, mm. whether whether they, you give space or not, they dominate. And I remember with my, my children's mum, mm. she just dominated in the house. Like, I, mm. I couldn't get in front of what she wanted to do mm. fast enough. Like, mm. she would just wake up and just go. Like, And I'd be talking to her, and she'd be just moving around the house, fixing, cleaning, moving. And I'm just like, can you bring me in? Tag me? Mm. I want to be in. Um, mm. And I realised that it's really difficult if you're just naturally good at something mm. to stop and bring the other person up to speed about what your vision is for the space, mm. then work with them at their speed to get to the ultimate solution. If you're just getting in the way, to be fair. Mm. I was trying to be nice about it. But I, I feel like when I'm when I'm doing something like that, it yeah. will yield something really big mm. in terms of business mm. or growth or pro providing an answer. And it's not like she, she's also a working person also, but in her way, in her own working realm, she does the exact same thing. Mm. Like when she's focused on, like she did a documentary and she watched every single frame that she shot and was typing up what everybody said mm -hmm. and time coding the whole thing, wow. which took her about three, four months. Wow. So when wow. she's doing that, oh, there's no point. I, you know, whatever my needs are, it's, in, it's, in, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I also, I love that about her, but I also just love that about people. Like have a thing mm -hmm. that you're incredibly passionate about outside of your home and outside mm -hmm. of your relationship that you can kind of look at them doing it and be like, wow. Mm. because that's yeah. the wow that got me there in the first place yeah right. true and so then if you argue with me about cleaning now i get it because i i need i like a clean space. i'm not one of those slobby men that can mm. live in squalor i have i have needs like i need to be i've got to touch people to touch stuff my mum would cuss mm. anyway um so i think it's important that we f I, I don't know how you find the balance in real time to do those things in a loving way mm. And I think that's the thing. I think most of the time it feels like an eject, a, a rejection of somebody's importance that they placed on something. And I don't want to do that. But inherently, I also am yeah, in flow. I've never really found an answer of true balance that makes sense and is consistent. It's always kind of hovered around just like you're not doing enough as, or somebody has to forgo something. I almost feel that like somebody loses. That's what it feels like. Somebody's losing. They're not actually satisfied with the solution that's created. I think people hold different spaces. I use very nice an example. At home, I like I do random things. Like I okay, I do the I do the gardening. Right. That's just my thing. I just like going out there and standing out there and watering the the all the plants and or I might sweep the kitchen floor. Right. Because that's just I just I, I like clean spaces. So I think different people will always hold different different spaces. But when one person makes a request of the other, mm. how you choose to prioritize that matters. So if Mary says to me, 
this is urgent. Like, for example, dry the clothes outside because it's 2 p.m. and, and the, sun. the sun's going to... That's what I always <laughs> have, to like like a I have to give him context. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> right? So because she gave me that picture, she painted yeah. that picture, I'm like, oh, actually, yeah, I get it. Right, I need to go and mm. do it now. I need to stop what I'm doing. Mm. Whereas there's certain things that it might be like, for example, bring the clothes in. Mm. You see, it's the other side of the picture. There isn't really much urgency no there. Urgency. Mm. I just carry on doing what I'm doing until she's like about to kick my ass for it. And she's like... Unless she says it's going <laughs> to yeah, rain. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, mm. Exactly. And then she's like, it's going to get all like damp if you don't yeah. bring it in. Yeah. Then I, you know, I get a move on. So I think there needs to be a balance of who's holding what spaces. Mm. And then when you communicate with somebody, what, how effectively have you communicated? Have you like mm. said, well, actually, look, this kind of needs to happen in the next hour. Not like in work talk, but just expressing a level of urgency. So mm. someone goes, actually, I need to do with this now. Or actually, I have some room. I can wait a little bit. Is there so, a way to p- apply some financial joy to that by taking Leslie's <laughs> suggestion earlier and delegating it to a dry, dry machine? Do you know what? It's interesting you say <laughs> that. So we on, on Wednesdays, we have uh, a, cleaner. a cleaner come to our house. Mm. And for a long time, we had this scarcity mindset of, I would do everything myself. Mm. That's a scarcity driven way of thinking. Mm. Whereas now we think, well, actually, like for example, our, like, although I water my garden, somebody else cuts the grass. Like I actually, and it's our neighbor. He just comes over once every two weeks and does it. And I just like just sitting back and having my tea and just watching that happen, mm. right? Because like I value just enjoying that moment and seeing it done excellently. Whereas mm. I could actually get quite lazy. I could go, well, actually, I know I meant to cut the grass today, but mm. I've got other things going on. And so using, looking at money from that perspective of money can bring me joy from this perspective is actually yeah. pretty important. Because absolutely, like a friend of ours mm. does a thing where we're, we're probably going to do this eventually, where he has a part-time chef, right? It costs about 25 quid an hour. Mm. and they come in they cook for about three hours and they come in once every three to four weeks and they just bulk cook what he yep. likes he loves Perfect. italian food they just bulk cook it puts it all into all these um tupperware freeze boxes it. Mm. freeze them mm. and you know he's won back a lot of time yeah mm. for quite you know not crazy amounts of money mm. but using the skill of somebody else who is probably looking for some side hustle work or some mm. part-time work mm. And, you know, using their money in a way that brings them joy that way. Mm. Absolutely. I'm all about, like, trying to gain as much time and minimise friction in the home by Mm. taking away the tasks that we both don't enjoy doing. Mm. My partner loves to cook. Like, he's, like, chief cook in the house. And that works perfectly well because... You know, I, I'm the person who I like. I don't mind cleaning. I like cleaning. So he go into the kitchen and destroy it. It'll be decimated. <laughs> There'll be I would have to wipe down the cupboards, mop the floor, <laughs> everything the after he's been in there. <laughs> but you know, I appreciate his his hand. He's got an amazing he can cook really well. And then I'll go in there and quite happily mm. tidy up. Now it sounds like a fair trade. It's mm. a completely mm. fair trade. I mean, it's something that works perfectly for us. But you know, traditional roles, mm. like him being, you know, the the person who does do the cooking in the home. It, you know, I worry sometimes that he's like bothered by that, by what other people might think. Like, you know, your mm. wife or your partner, mm. your girlfriend should be, you know, the primary person doing that in in the household. But it's the reverse in that household, and mm. it's brilliant. Now, what he's really terrible at is like being a tidy person and I'm incredibly tidy Mm. so you know I do as much as I can obviously I'm working a lot and when I can't do as much as I want to we have somebody come in Mm. just to top up a bit like you know you said about Mm. just finishing off doing it to that perfect resetting Mm. kind of thing and yeah it it buys us so much time and it takes away the bickering the expectations of him doing things that I want him to do but really he's not going to do it so Mm. I love that it's it's it just takes away Mm. the bickering Mm. and more time for joy Leslie because your your man isn't present I think it's easier to ask you this question (laughs) (laughs) he'd be watching in in the in the world that you're trying to create with your partner how do Mm. you describe the division of labor and responsibilities We've obviously come out, we're, we're trying to de- deconstruct patriarchy in a way, which means men just don't do this and women just do this. Mm. And in that evolution, we've never settled on 
I say we've never settled on, but there's never been a clear communication as to what world are we moving into? Because it's not actually matriarchal either. It's kind of like a hybrid of like shared patriarchy. I don't know what actually you would call it. What, what, just individually for you, what world are you trying to create with your partner that's sustainable and healthy? Well, we have a, how we've, how we've basically worked it out is that, you know, he has his things that he's passionate about. Like, you know, and I'm completely supportive of that. Mm. I have my things that I'm passionate about and he supports that. When it comes to the home, we divide our labor. I I concentrate on the things that I, I enjoy doing, I don't mind doing, and he does the same. And we just stick to that. Mm. It's It just works, but we're honest. I'm, I'm honest upfront by, you know, by being honest about not being able to do everything in the traditional sense, Mm. It just allows space for me and for him to identify what all our strengths are in the home. Mm. And by doing that, we create space. It just creates space for us to do things together and have joy in our relationship mm. because there's no underlying bad feeling about, well, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. Mm. Well, you know I wouldn't do that, and I know he wouldn't do that. So a real like there's, acceptance. Or... There's a clarity mm. in our roles. And, you know, I think... That takes time, but I think it also takes vulnerability and honesty about what you can do and what's expected mm. of you and what you expect of your partner. And it's, that's a conversation. It might take a few months. It may take a few years to get into mm. the groove where that works mm. for you. But if you've got if you've got the love for the person and you mm. really see yourself in the future with them, you'll work on it. Mm. Because, you know, the bickering will just kill the vibe and yeah. kill the relationship so quickly. That, that, that would, you, you've been out of the game, the long-term yeah. game for a second. Yeah. We're going to reestablish your future love soon. It's coming. As we're presenting these potential free women that you're going to whittle down to one. <laughs> hey, <laughs> you never know. With, mm. uh, with, unless you have consent for an alternative there arrangement. You go. Then what would that, even begin to look like for you? Well, who would make it past the threshold into the door and be invited to take a seat? When it comes, I will know. <laughs> I don't know how to articulate it. Mm. Yeah. Um, just in, when Lizzie was actually speaking, I started remembering some of the things I used to hate when I was actually living with someone. Mm. And it was weird stuff like not opening the fridge but with the handle, opening it with the mm. door, or when oh, she did that, yeah, okay, like it used to just drive me nuts. Like just open the bloody <laughs> use the handle. <laughs> use, but then the wor the worst actually one is you know cereal boxes mm. or any box, just not opening them properly, and just so so you can't close them yeah, back. Yeah, that used to drive me mad. And then the inside the thing just. Open it, jaga jaga, jaga and jaga, jaga like, jaga. <laughs> you, know I mean? you know what I'm saying? You used to drive me nuts. Like seriously, just open it carefully so we can close it back nice and neatly. And maintain the freshness. Freshness. Yeah. And I that, have that about biscuits because I love biscuits. Mm. So when people leave biscuits open oh. overnight yeah. and they go yeah. soft, yeah. that's one of the most uh, violent the experiences because now it's in that my mouth. How do you how do you get past that without like literally? I would go from zero to volcano wow. in a second. <laughs> like there was mm. just no reasoning with me because I'm like, I mean, it's a draft. <laughs> what, but what does it mean to you though, genuinely? <laughs> <laughs> you just sit me off. Maybe it, maybe it gives him it was peace. So, maybe it he was has a so lot of peace. Unreason it. it feels it feels like it's it, so I so what I always learn is yeah when those things take you from zero to a hundred it yeah. has an inherent meaning. It right. probably does connecting to like usually uh, something childhood related. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, where it's like it, it either means something around like someone doesn't care about yeah. the things either the food that you have or the things that you have, mm. or you make it directly just about you. They don't care about you, so they don't respect. Mm. That I don't, you I don't need wait. those I things. Don't know if yeah. it was that because mm. I I knew the the love and respect was there. It's it still is even though we're no longer together. So that that was never a question. It was it, and I probably should investigate what why it used to drive me mad. But it was the driving mad was she would laugh because mm. she like because it was so irrational mm. and my irrational anger like. I'm probably laughing through it as well. Mm. Like, so I, mm. I, just, I, I know I'm not being taken seriously. 
but it, it used to drive me mad. Um, I didn't know how to articulate it well enough. Like, please, can you stop doing this? Mm. Thing? Like, and I didn't know how to do it. But, but you know it, what? So, sometimes I think, because I, I have those things. I have things about um, not, like, seeing me. And um, I, I never forget there was this one story. I was in, yeah. I was in a relationship, and I, I think I was hungry. So I ordered food. No, I came home and, they were, and the food that was made was for children. Mm. It was like a children's meal. But you know those like after work, you're getting two sausages and some veg. And I was like, I ain't eating that. But I get what happened. Cool. Mm. So that ordered food in. And then when the food came, the kids were like, yay! Because obviously I ordered tasty stuff. So they're like excited. And now they're having their second dinner. And I'm like, okay, cool. And then I share... No, I go to share it up. I get up to go and get something to share it all up. And I come back and it had all been divvied out, including my share. Yeah. So this is like a minute and a half, by the way. And I just lost it. Like, I just, I just couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't, like, I couldn't find the language. And this is why therapy was so good. But I couldn't find the language to explain the importance of like I had made a provision for myself after no provision was made. Mm. And somehow the provision that I had made had still taken been away. divided and taken away to give some to our children, by the way, which is obviously they can eat whatever they want. But I was just like the inconvenience of coming home and being hungry and still being like, oh, it's okay. I'll find an answer. And then like, and this came up later on as a thing of just like, I understand that that's a thing for you. It's a thing for me. Mm. Like if you overlook me, in my inner circle, and you just blatantly just like take something from mine and just start eating it. I'm like, I beg your pardon. Mm. Um, and so I know that somewhere in my childhood, not being seen impacted me yeah. to the point that I protect wow. being seen by the people that I love. Like, I don't even mean like I'm here. I mean, just like I'm here. <laughs> like, mm. like I don't finish off all the food in the pot and don't think about what Marvin may need. Or don't finish the things that I, you know I use. Or, and don't, mm -hmm. you know, destroy mm -hmm. things that I care about. Like, you know, if my, uh, the batteries got taken out of uh, a remote for something that I only use. I think it was my Oculus, not Oculus, it was something. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, but I use this every day. And you've just taken the batteries out to put in a remote control car. And so, <laughs> you, if you text, no, but you know what I mean? It's yeah. just like, yeah. I get it. We're serving our yeah. children. But if you call me and be like, oh, oh we need man. more batteries, it really is not a problem. I get this. But when so you much. get home and you're just about to use the thing right. and you're just like, yeah. yo. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Go on, yeah. Ken. I feel like you have to say no, something. No, because this is one that really hits for me. It's the remote thing. Because, you know, like when you've had a really long day and 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 you're like, you know, I'm going to treat myself to an hour of a show. And then you're like, okay, where's the remote control? Mm, and mm. then <laughs> where is it? Let where alone is it? Like, remote. Where I actually is it? just expect the remote to be where I left it. Like, mm. well, where is it? Someone's taken it and it's gone somewhere. And then you find it, the back of the remote's gone, mm -hmm. and maybe one battery's disappeared. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> oh. yeah. And then you're oh, like, no. come on, you know, like. Yeah. So in that sense, I feel like, aren't aren't you guys understanding that I I sometimes just need this space just yeah. for me like i just need or i come in and it's like just all the cushions in the living room are all over the floor the coffee table like they just touch stuff everywhere mm. and i like clean spaces i like to come in i kind of feel like my space is inviting mm. i want to just i feel, feel like it's my calm space mm. and i'm like don't you know this is a living room yeah, yeah. 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 it's a living <laughs> listen there's some serious pet peeves that happen in couples yeah. Like, I, mm. I always watch people look for their keys and stuff. And I'm like, are you so insane? And that, like, I, I, I know I can remember where this started from. And that, yeah. Um, my bedroom when I was a kid was a, a bomb site, right. literally. But I knew where everything was. Every now and then, my mum would get so frustrated and then clean it for me. And as soon as she did that, like I couldn't find anything, mm. and I, I, I would have a nervous breakdown wow. and whatnot. But not only that, if I did misplace something, looking for it, I would have a nervous breakdown. Like mm. literally, the world's ended. This is me as a kid, wow. ah, like screaming and sh like having tantrums. But I'm like fourteen, fifteen, mm. and then one day I had one. And I goes, yeah, you started to bring girls back here. Like, you can't have this mess. So I start mm. tidying up so girls can come here. But then the tantrums, because it, this tantrum happened in front of a girl. Mm. 
literally, I couldn't a find a girl my or a woman. What age is this? So 14, 15. Oh, okay, cool. And whatnot. Like, I was still a virgin, like, mm. nothing that, but it just happened in front of her, and I was like, yeah, I'm never losing my virginity. <laughs> 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 so then I devised a, a method mm. where, cool, if I put my key in the same place every, every single yes. time as a habit, I will never have to look for them. Mm. And then also, I, I'm allowed to have two places that I can do that, that mm. in. So I know that I know exactly where it is. A or B. Mm. Do, do you feel like you just answered your question as to why the cereal box being untidy is a massive problem for you? Maybe. Maybe I've not even looked at it like that. And look, I, I genuinely, and again, because some of these sto- stories sound wild on their own, I've had this understanding of like how it manifests in my adulthood is always going to sound wild. Yeah. And I can obviously make it sound kinder by being like it connects to my childhood. Mm-hmm. But I've had to realise it's my responsibility to not have that reaction to things. Yeah. <clears throat> and the way that I have to do that is boundaries. So it's not about just... Because I think sometimes people talk about doing the work as if like therapy is a magic button to answers of your d- mm. deepest pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's not, it's a, it's a way of working. And, and the way me and my therapist talk about it is, exp- I say as if we're a team, the <laughs> way that my therapist talks to me about it is, it's about expanding the amount of time something can happen before it gets to that threshold. Mm. Okay. Mm. And so it's not just like it never happens. It may not happen on the third, it may happen on the fifth. Mm. And that's an improvement. And if you still build on that and practice, it will get more and more times before you react. Mm. But I also feel like it's, a very good understanding of just like in not allowing everybody into a space where that can occur mm. constantly. And again, so me not having boundaries meant it was just like, hey, everyone come and take everything. Mm. And then when it was like, oh, I need this one thing for myself and I had to give it up, of course I didn't feel good. Mm. But I gave away too much. Mm. Mm. So if I have 100, I can say I have 50. Come and take 50 of these things and handed them out. And I kept 50 for myself. I still have an abundance, but also I've given out some. Whereas I would just give out 99 and be like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> What's happening here? Yeah. And I think in that imbalance, and I think the last thing that I, I found that is that I wasn't recharging. Mm. I wasn't replenishing myself and I wasn't loving on myself. So then I think if you're... If you're like, even for things like that, if you're stretched in other ways and other things are going on, that does become super important. Mm. But if you've just woken up and you see certain things, you're just like, "Eh." (laughs) it's like, ah, the cereal box, fine. (laughs) I'll do it later. You just have capacity. Mm. So rest and like loving on myself. How do you communicate that 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 to someone you're living with? So uh, we, 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 we actually have weekly meetings, which just sounds bizarre. But I like concepts in relationships. I don't like living in just like, hopefully I'll love you and hopefully I'll love you next week. We have like, we're, we implemented this thing, idea of weekly meetings. So on a Sunday, mm. it's a reconciliation day. Mm. Like, how do you feel I've loved you this week? Um, how do you feel like um, I've missed anything? Is there anything next week? Or what's your vision for your day is a really mm. good question to yep. ask in the beginning of the day. Those little things create capacity and understanding when you don't know what's going on. Mm. And I think for me... Any healthy relationship that I can ever come across, there's some version of those tools in place yeah. mm. to just open up the door the for you know, conversation. We spoke one for that couple. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what what we do is every night we have dinner together and mm. we have we sit around the table, never on our laps, never in front of the TV, no distractions, and we just talk about how our day has been. Mm. Mm. What's your day going to be looking like tomorrow? What was good about today? What things, you know what I mean? You just check mm. in, keep on checking in. You're seen in your herds. Mm. And you know, in doing these things, can you speak about what the, the other person is doing to affect you? That yeah, you're, yeah, you're not yeah. You can bring those things up for sure because by that time, it hasn't built up over a month or two months or three months. It's daily. Mm. Yeah. You literally have to be practical about these things sometimes and they just become the norm. And then you realize that it minimizes the triggering because you know the next day at dinner it's going to come up again mm. it's going to get dealt with there's mm. not going to be a lot of time in between mm. where Do things know, don't get discussed there's it's interesting talk about relationships that uh, we read some astonishing stats yesterday around financial infidelity mm. Mm. Oh. 
Wow. Yeah. Like so, yes, this so, is so, <laughs> yeah. Bars. This yeah, is so a lot of couples, because they don't really communicate and don't have certain things in place, like we've just been talking about, um, don't know that their partner is, for example, um, in a lot of debt. So mm -hmm. I had an example uh, not too long ago of someone who said their partner had built up six, had maxed out six credit cards. Wow. And they didn't know about it. Wow. So it's like that, that then raises crazy questions like, where, wait, what? Where? Wh is what? this a, a relationship or a marriage? Oh, this is a marriage. Yeah, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is a marriage with mm. children, with children. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and so um, because of poor communication and other things, mm. um, couples don't know things about their partner. Like some of the stats even showed that some couples don't know that their partner has a, a piece of a, of a house, has some ownership mm. in another property, for example or that they impulse buy, or that, you know, because they haven't created the space to just talk about mm. some some underlying issues, some kind of root cause issues that exist in their relationship. So one thing we do, we have a money day. Mm. Ah. So the money day is a space for us to just, first of all, understand where we're at. So mm. what's going on? Are we al aligned as a couple on what we see as our as our vision and what we're working towards? But it's also to look at micro things like, for example, are we like, what's been going on with our finances? Are we overspending in some areas? Are we not? Mm. Uh, and also to get a picture, just to look at what's happening with our assets, our liabilities. Are we progressing? Do we have a full picture? Like, do we know all the debts that exist? Do we know all the assets that we own and stuff mm. like that? Um, even things like start to think about uh, parenting your parents. Mm. Did you know at some point you've got to actually parent your parents? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you start to think about legacy and oh wow, you know, has dad written a will? Is have it you normal that a, a oh, yeah. two year old yeah. is doing it to me? Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's you, good though. Have you, have you spoken to yeah. your mum and dad about X, Y, and Z? Mm. And so if you don't have that space yeah. where you come together and start to have those 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 conversations. Mm then there'll be so many unknowns that mm. exist in the background. How, how often yeah. do you guys do? do Typically like once that? a week. Typically. But yeah, it's, it used to be religiously once a week, mm. but not they're not so religious about doing it once a week now. Mm. Because um, there's flow and just well, an understanding. Things have been and, sorted out, I guess. Yeah, things just get yeah. sorted out. And we always have, like, we check in now and again every yeah, day in every, our conversations. Um, but fortnightly, definitely, it happens more so now than when we started out. And is it only and the money you guys speak about? No, or the other no, things? not at all. So I particularly love the joy parts of it. So we're talking about our long term goals. What's mm. our joint visions? What's our separate goals? How are we making that happen? How are we setting aside money for those long term goals? And so it's just a great time for partners to actually come together because a lot of the time we're so busy living our lives and we're all chasing our own individual goals. But, you know, what are we doing together jointly? How are mm. we supporting each other Absolutely. on those goals? So, yeah. yeah. You, you know, because that. people yeah. like this whole adage, um, business never personal, but because you are having a money day, although you've added the joy parts of it, do you bring the personal stuff of your marriage in on that day and discuss that as well on that day? So we, we, the, our personal stuff we discuss pretty much every day okay. mm. because we work, we, Mary and I work, work together and we enjoy each other's company. We go for walks mm. and during those long walks, we just talk about stuff. We just catch up. So I'd say the personal things like that are happening every day. Mm. But as, as a, from a financial perspective, money just has its own space for us mm. to, and I also find someone has to have responsibility for it. So we've got this concept of the home CFO. So you need somebody who needs mm. to be responsible for money in a household. Mm, yeah. Because money is, wealth building is like doing admin. Mm. And admin needs to be done yeah. by somebody. And mm. somebody needs responsibility over it. Like, for example, have you completed this form and sent it out? Have you paid that penalty notice? <laughs> Which, you know, a lot of people don't like dealing with. And there's always a cost to delay to doing things. Yeah. Mm. So I think with in a, in a relationship, there needs to be someone who says, actually... Do you know what? I know we're going to meet on f on Friday or Sunday or whenever, but I'll just prepare like a little mini agenda for us to talk about or a little thing for us to consider. Mm. That way, you know, the conversation actually happens in a fruitful way and both people know like who's doing what and they're able to walk away with, okay, here's what we talked about. Maybe next week when we meet, we'll kind of like catch up on 
some of these points you talked about. Love mm. that. Yeah. So practical. I know. I'm yeah. into yeah. practical moods. It's weird because you almost create a a box to have fun in. And it's almost like you have to build the box though. And most people mm, just gosh. go have fun and play around and then they realize, like I think one of my bigger fears is um, getting into that. S- I think so for, I specifically feel like black men around 50 to 60 start dying. Mm. And most of them die alone. Wow. And that's a fear for me. Like, and it's not even really about the alone part. I just, I just feel like what a waste of, of life. But you have children. No, but like, I don't think, I, me specifically, mm. I invested my children enough to believe that I will have a relationship with them. But you also can't guarantee it. It may not even be like they don't f*** with you. It could be just, I'm at uni, dad, or I'm living yeah, abroad okay. now. They're and occupied. it could be, yeah, it could be mm. genuine things for them. And I, d- I don't want them to be like, but come back and visit me every Sunday. Mm. So I have friends and people to be around. Mm. But yeah. I think dying alone and the amount of men who die without anyone coming to visit them or without their partner's care, because they didn't look after their partners yeah. in those key years, they didn't invest time. Mm. That for me is a massive thing of just like, what a sad way to go. Mm. And I think it's really important that like we invest in those relationships and we don't get stuck up on washing the dishes and you know those types of things. Because if that's the reason why someone feels that you don't care about them, it's genuinely a thing to look at for yourself if your goal is, I don't want to be alone. Because you can't keep reinventing yourself with 30 year olds every like year and be like, oh, it'd be fine, I'll find somebody else. It's mm. like there'll become a point where, yo, your body functions aren't working. Mm. You need to be with someone that can identify a stroke from a distance or something. Absolutely. Hey. Wow, wow. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think that's important. And I think uh, I think fear is quite a strong word, but I do think it's a, a, a element of awareness that I have. And also just like financially being hyper independent on my own like i think i told you when yeah. we by the way i'm in the book we didn't talk about that. oh That's yes like, exactly oh you are in I, mean, the book. I did make i made the short list yes, okay. yes oh. you are in um the but i think another thing is it's just like ensuring that i'm still aggressively planning for my later years yes on my own terms yes because who, who knows where i will be but yeah. l- what makes that loneliness worse is if you don't even have money either. Money. Mm. So being having no money and being alone puts you in a position where you're just super vulnerable to yep. any and everything. And it's like, it's different if you're like 60, feeling a bit alone and be like, I'm going to go to Jamaica. Yeah. <laughs> just like, you know, I'm going to buy a house and live in the mountains and live yeah. a humble life, but yeah. I can choose and have choose. some agency as to what my future is. So, so important. I think that's important. Do you know what? Very. Can I give you a real case study real mm. quick? So we had a, someone messaged us. She said, I'm 59 years old. I've been forced to early retire Mm. because I can't get a job. Yeah, no one wants to hire me, she Mm. says. And I'm now having to rely on my private pension, which isn't very much. And at the same time, I'm noticing a trend amongst other women facing the same problems. Mm. Because they raise children instead of putting their money in the pension. Yeah, and all Mm. kinds of things have had to happen. And then there's also the unspoken elements of as you get older your wealth building potential doesn't carry on going up into the sky Mm. right there is some something that happens Mm. right and and for some of us if we're not adequately prepared there is a challenge there Mm. you know and that then starts to create other outcomes and then parallel to that you're then looking there's a show on netflix called live to 100 have you seen it i was just about to mention that yeah so these basically these centenarians people who live over the age of 100 I looked at some research in the UK that says that there are around 14,000 centenarians in the UK. Mm. And that's been growing rapidly over time since the last census in 2011. Mm. So if we're all on average living longer, right, and Mm. expect to live longer, and if we're all with much more data looking after our health and well-being and so on, money plays an even bigger role because you would need, you would need, you know, you need resources to be around for longer, mm. you mm-hmm. know, to be able to maintain that. But not, money doesn't play the exclusive role. Relationships plays as an, an even bigger role. Yeah. Mm. Because in that piece of research they did, um, they looked at, they interviewed these people in Okinawa and uh, in Japan, uh, in, yeah, Canada. in Greece and different parts. Mm. And what were some of the things they found? Yeah, so also, so they found that there were um, five parts of the world that had the most cluster of centenarians, so people who lived um, up to 100 and beyond. Um, And they found like there was nine common lifestyle traits 
that were common amongst all of those parts of the country um countries where you had the most centenarians and some of them were like plant-based plant fun so they they ate 90 percent plant-based food um they also ate 80 percent full so they didn't eat to the point they were bloated they actually mm. left space for the food to digest and they had their heaviest meal in the early afternoon and their lightest meal in the evening um they walked a lot they in nature and some of the conveniences that we have now um it's actually ironic that those are the things that are now making us unhealthy like the cars mm. um we're just we're just finding shortcuts and we're not being as active as we should be um they did lots of physical exercise physical like exercise. being yeah, able yeah. to like sit down on the floor and get mm. back up without mm. like mm. holding onto a chair in their 90s. you know and they're in their 90s mm. Mm. but the one that really stood out to me was the, the relationships. relationships which is what you were touching yeah which on is what you were saying well. is that they've yeah. maintained long term relationships of people who are actually intentionally in their lives day to day that yeah. challenge that marvin yeah. gave so you and mary and leslie to find me a woman yeah. please. <laughs> please. <laughs> we want you living to 100 Absolutely. right uh, yeah we yeah because you know those people that live to 100 they yeah. had a proper um network. network they had a community and they had purpose yeah. something that you speak about um Ikigai. Ikigai. Mm, yes. yes. They, they had a purpose. What's Ikigai? Ikigai. Uh, it's a Japanese word for finding your purpose. Mm, mm, mm. But the most thing was, you know, the community. So their children, they looked after their children so well that their children would then look after them when they're older. Mm. But even if they didn't have children, their partners, you know, the wives, the husbands, they stuck Together. to each other um, because they had nurtured those relationships. Mm. And, you know, they also had a community, like whether it was a church, so Seventh Day Adventist, they yeah. had something that they all had common yeah. goals and values that they, you know. And Seventh Day Adventists are also plant based people. They're also plant based. So yeah, 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 yeah I knew very... that they live they live longer. Than but, the average. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I often think that the point about the children looking after your children and your partner, mm. there is a conflict there because often in our quest for money and the quest for success, yeah. we sacrifice. We those sacrifice things. those yeah. things, yeah. you know. And time passes. Next thing you're like, oh, it's my fiftieth. Oh, it's my sick, you know, you're, you're, we're all getting older, but then it's becoming too late to mm. actually prioritize those loved ones, really like genuinely make it a part of your internal culture mm. to sow into fruitful relationships. Mm. So I think there's a reflective point there around like, what's really important to us, you know, yeah. like what brings us joy? Yes, okay, you, you know, earnings are important, but what other investments do we need to be making? Mm. To better in people. people in people yeah exactly people, yeah so yeah. I, th I think one of my when I, when dope black was like at its at its peak and it was kind of still infancy but in its peak the one thing that i was really obsessive about was this idea of an intentional community and i used to think about it all the time for those reasons mm. because inherently most of the time when we get tripped up is because we're trying to overwork mm. um and we're under resourced and our children suffer as a result, just time-wise. Yeah. Yeah. We don't get the time with them. And I think about, back to like the black community historically, and like, you know, if I saw your children, I'd slap them by the back of the head and we'd go home. Mm -hmm. And if I saw them throwing stones or something, I could talk to them. And it meant that there was a collective responsibility for everybody that was black mm -hmm. in that area at the time. Mm -hmm. Also, it's like when you go back to a Caribbean country, and you probably know this, if you say your last name, it has a meaning. Um, yeah. So if I if, I, if I, I went back to Antigua and I said, well, on one side it's the Nibs and the other side it's the Brooks. Oh, we know the Nibs. The Nibs, uh, uh, they used to do this. Like, and it, and, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The they'll community. tell you exactly wh what yeah. they did, who they were, mm -hmm. what job they had. And then I, I got invited uh, to the, um, the tourism, head of tourism. Uh, he's an MP, but I went to go sit down with him. And he was like, so, so, what's, so what's your father's name or your grandfather's name? And I told him, he was like, oh, yeah, he just picked up his phone, <laughs> picked it up, and he was like, "Yeah, where, where, where's the family there? Where are they?" And then he, and it was like, "Oh, what well, they moved? Mm. No, because they used to be in the police office." So he hung up, picks up the police office. Oh, is he still working there? Yeah, he's still working. He's not there now. All right, cool. cool. He just hangs up again. So basically, I could have spoke to my great uncle wow. just in that moment because it's that simple to be like, "Yeah, I'll trace you. I know where your people are." Yeah. And there's a couple of things that that does which we don't it's have here. As, yeah. as, a, as a visitor in this country, we just don't have those ties. And I think it leaves us slightly aimless. Yeah. So listening to you two is great because I think you found an anchor through finance that structures you. 
and gives you a clear place of where you need to be and what you need to be doing. Mm. I think for many other people who, who were never going to be earning, I'm not saying that's the only reason you can make surplus, but they were never going to be earning six figure as a household. Mm. They're, they're, they are public servants. They, they work at a level, which means they have enough to survive. Mm. But those people deserve a form of security and anchoring also. Mm. And I think that's what community does. Mm. But trying to create a community against the elements of the country, I find incredibly difficult. Because the second, like I might be okay, but then to make sure five, six, seven, eight people are, are okay, we genuinely have to find a new revolutionary model of how we co coexist. Mm. Because if somebody else out there is like challenged because COVID and, we, and eight people lose your job in your community, mm. that, that's a massive fracture. It's so expensive to exist here. So mm. if anyone mm. comes up with an answer how to do that in a fair and equitable way, mm -hmm. because my last point is every time these communities are led by men, something goes wrong. <laughs> right. The SWAT team have to come and get them. Someone's <laughs> having children with fudging uh, other children. It's a whole... Every, if, I don't know if you've seen the documentaries on channel, on Netflix. There's one about, is it Waco or one of those? Right. And the guy was like getting guns and he was creating this army and he believed that they were coming to get them. And because he was so aggressive, they actually came and got him. <coughs> and then about half of them, most of them died. And you're just mm. like, Th this would never happen if it was led by women. Mm. It would just never happen. So I think it has to be a matriarch community. That's the one thing I know for it to work. Mm. But the financial rules, the like how we build it, I think it's all open, but I think it's the only real answer for a collective of black people to sustain themselves. Can I, can I give you one answer? Yeah, yeah, go so for it. So I think, so in, in about an hour and a half, I've got to go meet my sisters, right? Both of them. And one thing m my parents had instilled into us is the importance of unity. Mm. So I'm in a situation where my, my sisters are quarreling, quarreling right now. And I have been brought up with this idea of uniting us no matter what mm. so i've booked lunch we're having that lunch and that lunch is a unity lunch mm. it's a it's a lunch for us to to put all the cards on the table hug make up and start supporting each other and our children now i think this is very important because i think from a communal perspective that unity needs to begin at home mm. we have to be able to find togetherness in our own vicinity at home because yeah. if you can't show it to your people around you how on earth are you going to show it to people you've met or mm. strangers mm. you know so there's that practical aspect then there's the mindset aspect so for example we have a culture of hoarding knowledge mm. right mm. which is you know stuff but you don't want to tell people you're like because your scarcity of thinking is keeping is making you kind of think there's only one pie in the world and if someone takes a bit of that pie they're taking it away from you rather mm. than you know so i think there's a practical element of trying to create unity starting from our immediate spaces then there's a mindset element of actually do you know what me helping you doesn't take anything away from me mm. so i think it's that combination of beginning with what you've got already but also trying to help us to think differently you know mm. in the us helping each other it's not it's not like it doesn't cost us to do that it actually moves us all forward how mm. do you make that look attractive though because you know we all kind of we mm -hmm. all know that message mm -hmm. but i think having something set in in an intentional goal mm -hmm. so we're helping each other we're creating a community mm -hmm. because we're going to gain this mm. so we're going to build yes. a, a retirement village in the caribbean we're mm. going to yes i'm going to build one in barbados you know there's mm -hmm. going to be one in antigua and mm. you know maybe one in nigeria that mm -hmm. we can all communicate with each other travel make a, a lifestyle that's something that we can I look like forward that. to if we put this time and energy into something mm -hmm. then we're going to gain the yeah. vision this the vision yeah. Yeah. and i think having it um not led by something mm. makes it a bit difficult and easy yeah. to drop out yes the so, other thing you know? i think is really important is you have to kind of keep it under the radar mm. wow. I, I don't feel like so i think in our community so it's really interesting i had a conversation with someone and she's a quite a divisive figure in our community and when i was talking to her she was just like the reason why i'm so harsh to other black people is because I spend a significant amount of time outside of our community mm. and I see how they move. And the things that we're thinking about and worried about and protesting for are a complete waste of time. 
it's just like it's just a complete waste of time because the answer is economic power yeah. and being and, and also being organized mm -hmm. so she says if she, if she goes to like a council meeting in any borough there are no black people there mm. all these other communities are in there talking yeah. about where they put um, parking restrictions and yeah. uh, planning laws and handing out licenses to things and they're buying up all these different territories and she told the story of there was a mm. councillor she went to one of those meetings and someone who attended was talking about the orthodox jewish community in stamford hill Mm -hmm. and how some of them are moving because they actually don't have abundance of money very mm -hmm. much uh, opposite to what very anti-Semitic thoughts are. They don't have lots of money. They don't have abundance. So now that they're realizing that everything around them is going up in price, but there's some value in their house, they're selling up mm -hmm. and they're moving to a seaside town. So they've been quietly just buying up a street mm -hmm. and they put some some businesses in there, some shops in there, and they're buying up the houses on the road and they plan to move at a, for for unforeseen date. Yeah? yeah. None of this is publicized anywhere. Mm -hmm. This is the this is there's not a YouTube account that's like blow by blow strategizing what the community are doing. They're just doing it. Mm -hmm. So I think when you start to announce it, mm -hmm. you get people who aren't particularly serious showing up and being like, mm -hmm. also people who aren't from your community that have not got your best interest in heart start blocking you. Mm -hmm. And it's like all of a sudden you ah. manifest a distraction rather than a genuine goal. Mm -hmm. So if I was to ever create something again, it would never be known. So are you experiencing this kind of with Dope Black Dads? It's not really Dope Black Dads. I think mm. just when, and there's many other variables, so it's not really about that. But like, I realized that as we started shouting about it, mm it lost its focus. Mm -hmm. mm. When it was just us doing what we were doing, mm. yeah. and you know, because you yeah. were there from day one, so. the yeah. conversations, I, I think I cried three times in like mm. a week mm. from the things that men were saying. Like it mm. woke me up because I've always lived very individual. I don't, mm. I've never really lived in life with lots of people before. So my whole, up until 35, I was just living, working, doing what I had to do. That's the first time I sat and listened to men properly. Mm. And it shook me. I was like, wow. Yeah. So I, I, and the thing is, I was in my own feelings, but I was like, I've got to do something. Yeah. So that's how all of that happened. That whole period of time was me responding to what I was processing for the first time. And I just think that with, there was no plans to make it more. Because if it was, it would have just probably happened. But it was, it was just to exist. Mm -hmm. Be there, say the things we needed to say, represent men in a much better way, have really genuine conversations with us and where we're not as good as we want to be and where we are working and we're not being heard. All those mm -hmm. things mattered. But if I was going to create a genuine economic movement, I would never, ever talk about it. Yeah. I hear that. But talking about dope black dads, but I have to say you've created like a dope community. <laughs> no pun intended. Like it's Thank really you. good. And anytime Ken says he's going to something that you're organizing, I'm like, yep, yeah, babe, go to it. Yeah. <laughs> he always comes back feeling, you know, he's buzzing. Yeah. Like replenished, refreshed. And mm. yeah, just it's I, always I appreciate good I think there's a, it's an interesting point you make about revealing what you're doing. There's a great talk by Derek Sivers. It's a TED talk. Mm on why you shouldn't share your goals with other people. <laughs> wow. Um, it's very short TED talk, but it's very powerful because um, psychologically, when you tell people your goal, um, there's a reaction. People are like, yeah, but there's a lot of buzz. And the research actually shows that most people don't then take the steps to do what they said they were going to do because mm. they had announced it and gotten the validation. The validation. The it was like all the hype. Wow. And so they're less likely to actually then take the steps to do it. When in actual fact, if you do want to tell people, the research is saying that you should mention it, but without asking for the validation. Mm. You know, there's a way you can still communicate that, but you're much better off actually keeping it and then maybe sharing once you've done something rather than saying, here are my intentions and here's what I think mm. I'm going to do. Mm. So it's not just... Um, observing it from those communities is actually there's a psychology around that mm. that's actually that actually means that people are actually getting things done yeah. rather than not getting things done I, I also just genuinely feel like there's an element of fear mm. like when someone says we're going to do something for black people either, either it's like you're one of the rare people who can and will do something and there's so much need in our community that if someone says I'm going to help economic empowerment you will see a, a complete um, overwhelming demand on that very short resource mm. and that makes it difficult 
And if you don't have abundance resource yourself to create a structure mm. and a barrier to be able to like provide it consistently, like if you haven't got a machine, it will deplete inherently. Yes. Yes. And mm. so I think it's really important if we ever were to offline have this conversation about how do we do something dope for me, I almost would build it like a company would build Absolutely. it. This, this is why Beloved even, even was created. But the whole, the whole point of it was like, rather than sit there and be on the front lines saying what we want, we just became a structure. And the structure had a very clear operational model. Mm -hmm. And so it's a service. Mm -hmm. It's not a, we're here to help. It's mm -hmm. just, you want something, it goes in here, and then it comes out here with Systemized, this, 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 this deliverable. Yeah. It's not emotional. It's mm. not personal. It's not good or bad. It just mm. is. And we just That's deliver outcomes mm. through that process. Yes. What I want to do is take that process and apply it to other things mm. that aren't just about turning over revenue or products and services in that way, but answers like let's have a global retirement home mm -hmm. project. But the way I would do it is not to be like, hey, guys, let's all come around my house for tea and let's talk about a retirement project. I would go away, get planning, get a site. Someone would build me a 3D model. Yep. Someone would do me the design. There's a, an investment arm to it. It's just clear mm -hmm. what you're paying in. This is the buying price. Mm. And then just whoever shows up, shows up. Because I think the other part of selling the idea mm -hmm. at the beginning, again, you just get pulled into multiple different versions of what it could be. And yeah. why don't we do one in Trinidad first? And, and then before you know it, you're not actually doing anything. So there's a uh, bit of that part yeah. as well as the, once you say it to yourself, you might just think, ah, oh, <laughs> I did it. <laughs> you yeah. haven't done anything. Yeah. Leslie. Yes. Have you have you been a part of? I feel like some reason you've been a part of some sort of financial movement, like a partner times ten or something. Have you been a part of any of these hmm. um, black empowerment movements before? Well, actually, no. Um, but what I've been around are people who, from maybe about ten, fifteen years ago, mm. were brave enough and had the courage to embark in a property investment strategy mm. that I completely understood and joined in and got in in my mid-20s mm, which wow. really afforded me financial freedom by the wow. time I was 35 wow. so Amazing. you know being around people who you really see and understand their vision and mm -hmm. just having the courage to step outside the societal norms yeah. and also you know Thank God they shared mm -hmm. that information with me. Mm. Yeah. Um, but clearly, I they understood that I would understand what was needed. And they clearly knew that I wasn't going to be wasting their time. Because mm. I came at a point of desperation. To, mm. I needed to do something else. Mm. Corporate life didn't suit me very yeah. well. Yeah. You know, even the commute here today reminded me, triggered me. <laughs> I was like, Lord have mercy. Mm. Yeah. This true... Tr ugh, yeah. So I knew, uh, you know, from a very young age that having a plan and having a vision, mm. executing is mm. absolutely imperative and having systems and being mm. disciplined. Yeah. Wow. But the vision is the most important thing. Mm. So, you know, I'm a very vision led person. Like mm. my vision and my um, is sometimes not understood, but, mm. you know, you know your vision mm. and you have your trust and belief in yourself. You go mm. for it. I'd love everyone to end on just what is your vision for your later years? Like, how do you mm. see your time and yeah. what kind of people are around? Where are you in the world? Yeah. Like, what does it look and feel like? We'll start with Mary. Yeah. Oh, so I picture myself in a nice hot country. Mm. Um, and our children are, they're grown now. They're probably at uni or they finish and they've got their own families. And we're in a position where they can drop their children off for the weekend or the week or whatever because they want to go on holidays, mm. you know, just the partners, husband and wife. And yeah, we've got the, the room to have our grandchildren and we've got the time to um, be intentional with them, take them to the beach, you know, whatever. And yeah, it's just Ken and I go for daily walks. Mm. We exercise, we eat healthy, probably have a chef. But there's that peace that we have in our environment um, with our children. We're not a burden to them um, mm. and they're not a burden to us because we've set them up financially with not just the, the resources, but also the opportunities for them to create that life for themselves financially. Mm. Yeah, 
Wow. Bit of a waffle. <laughs> wow. I'd say mine is um I see a later life where we're we're moving around the world. Um we're just literally we we already own a home that's fully paid, mortgage free, we'll lock it up and we've got other investments. We're able to like just go around the world and go where we want to to actually learn and experience local culture, not just in all inclusive like spaces, but actually and nothing wrong with that by the way, just a different way of looking at having an experience. Mm. But actually going in and trying to experience things but in a in different parts of the world, different mm. parts of the world. But doing it with people, I want to be able to move around with people as well because I just feel like I've never had I've never had a guy's holiday, for example. Mm. Never been on one. Yeah. I don't know what that feels like. We're taking like. you to South Africa, by the way. But well, that's, that's they, the whole thing. Do you know what? I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to come. I've never, I've never had one. You yeah. know, so I want to feel that. I want to just like have spaces where like we come out, we're sitting around in an evening, there's wood fire burning and everyone's sitting around having drinks and chatting and connecting. Like, I think that's a really beautiful vision. Mm. Um, and like you say, our children are fully financially independent and they are they are kind, compassionate people who look mm-hmm. at the world in a very different way and are solutions driven. And we're able to connect with them really well and they connect with us. And so that for me is is the vision I, I see um, how I'd like life to kind of pan out. Mm. <laughs> Powerful. Right, what about you, Leslie? Mm, mine's really simple. Mine's a statement. Like, I want to have an experience-based lifestyle until I die. Mm. So... A bit like your experience, mm. um, experiencing different um, cultures and countries and people and cuisines and foods and activities globally, right? So I'm already mm. on that journey, mm-hmm. um, but I want to continue until I die, mm. literally. But, you know, if you want to come snowboarding in Japan yeah. in March, come what? to Japan. That's, That's where I'm going to be. Oh. Wow. So, um, we, I'm a part of a group called the Nubian Ski Oh. And we, we've been going for 22 years. Okay. Do you know what? Is that in the UK? Is that... Yeah, UK based. Can right. Beginners can we, can Absolutely. We... Right. Absolutely. <laughs> we, need to, we need to find out how to join. Yeah, yeah. so um, <laughs> I'm into um, pursuing activities that aren't necessarily or, you know, associated mm. with 51 year old black women, mm. right? So diving bungee jumping, if you're into anything that's adventure-based yeah. or a little bit extreme, mm. I think give it a go. Have some wow. courage, yeah. have some mm. fun, but also back it up with some investments, yeah. you know? Mm. So get that start, get yeah. that part of your life sorted out yeah, first yeah, yeah. and then let that feed and fuel your your passions. Listen, oh, we're cool. joining you with those experiences. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Come, yeah. come. What about you, David? <laughs> um, it's funny because I feel like I've been ticking off so many things that of who I want to be when I'm an old man and the one thing I've not invested in is the financial side of things mm-hmm. but in terms of health like oh, yeah. I, I'm a gym gym rat I love going to the gym That's and good. whatnot um I eat well um I try to keep my mind right I try to stay spiritually thing so my I vision of me as an old man is just fit healthy mm. and whatnot being able to get off the floor without needing yeah. a chair yes. without groaning um I've, I've said this on a previous podcast the groaning starts in your 20s it doesn't yeah. start when you're old like mm. you start getting up and creaking and groaning and whatnot and yeah. after a while your mind just automatically when you go to do certain things wow. you do that so the physical side of things i've always tried to be on top of the mental side of things I've always tried to be on top of and that um, as long as I'm fit, healthy mm. and my sons can come and we run a chalice, we play <laughs> chess, oh, that's my amazing. idea. Wow. Um, I've always known that I'm not going to be an old man in this country. I don't think the mm. cold is great for old bones mm. and whatnot. So I'd like love to do the summer here, get refreshed because I love London. Mm. I do. But the winter months top down in the winter that's what winners do as mm. Mr. Sean JZ oh. said so yeah that's that's my idea of being older but I do need to after today's thing I've realised that I've left a big massive hole mm. I need to start filling in and it's never too late it's never yeah. too late exactly yeah. 
Look, thank you all for being here. That, you didn't that, say yours. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's a common habit as well. Um, mine, I, I think, uh, definitely warm. I think I'll be in uh, uh, South Africa. I think I'll be just outside Cape Town. Um, there are beautiful landscapes there. Mm. Uh, I found the most peace I've ever had in my whole life there. So I see that as a more of a spiritual home. Mm. Um, and they have obviously by the water, you have Indian Ocean, Atlantic Ocean. Um, I would love to have an excessive piece of land with other homes on it with people mm. that I love in distance. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, like I've seen this like model of uh, like a circle where everyone's back garden is centered into like this one communal space. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just looked really like peaceful because you can go out the door and be by yourself or go backwards and run into your people and use that communal space for like the kids and, you know, for shared and communal living. And I thought that was a really beautiful way to exist. Mm. That's nice. Um, and I think my whole thing is like people over things. Yeah. So experiences top, but then I'd rather have like people around and just laugh and be whatever. Mm. This is why I host at my house all the time mm. is that's really joyous to me. Um, and then uh, the rest of it, I d- you know, I don't think so. I think as Ken identified, my whole vision is very experience led and it needs to be have a bit more financial notes in. So I think I'm going to take the conscious note to do that and be very specific. Uh, but that's pretty much it, man. Like, I, and I definitely want to be in love. Like, I don't even really mean yeah, romantic true. love. I want to have someone that I look at and admire and just like enjoy seeing them existing and it has a deeper meaning for me. Like I think I have a couple of female friends um, specifically where I have great friendships with them and I just enjoy them in whatever it is that they're doing in every any version of them. And I'm really honored to have them in my life. And I think the men in my life, the one thing that I'm asking the men in my life, I think Darwin's probably the only one who lives like this, is like mm. there's an element of freedom mm. I think we're still in our heads as men. Like we still have a thing that we're trying to do and we're trying to uh, tackle something and achieve something and mm-hmm. break something down. And we don't use our inner child enough. We don't relax enough. So I'm trying to keep that balance. Like I want to be fun, joy, and all of those things, but I protect and provide anyway. Like I almost don't even have to say that out loud because it's just been happening for so long. But if I don't tuck in my joy and my rest, like I think it just, it kills all of the possibilities of this other thing. So. That's a really important thing. that, And that's why I do intentional men work now is I want to poke them and be like, you're not doing the things. Like you're doing what the society has told you and you're not happy. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So that's a really important thing for me. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Oh, thank you all, man. That was like a therapy session. Uh, ah. Should we just take some time just to close our eyes and like <laughs> allow the energy that we created to leave our bodies and return to the state that we were once in, a happy place. Visualize that person you love and that food you want to eat or that person you want to eat. Oh, yes. <laughs> and double it. Thank you. <laughs>